we're here today to talk a little bit more about Mycroft. Um, my name is Steve, and joining me today is Chris. Say hello, Chris. Hi. <laughs> um, well, is, yes, just uh, in case you're confused. <laughs> yeah, um, we are in different time zones, if you couldn't tell. Uh, I'm from North America, and my compadre there is from down under. Uh, <clears throat> so, <laughs> so <laughs> the uh, the purpose of this video is, or these series of videos, uh, hopefully, is I I approached Mycroft as a project as a person who has not done any kind of development work for anything related to AI, and I looked at this and thought, hey, this is really neat. I'd like to get involved in this, and so. Um, I did what everybody did, does when they don't know anything, and they go out and try and teach people. I wrote some articles on opensource.com, uh, and from that came a lot of questions about, well, how do we how do we do these things? How do we get involved? What do we do? And a lot of people are looking for a more interactive way, and hopefully, if we get enough feedback from this, Chris and I will do a couple more of these videos, and we get some feedback. We'll will help shape what we kind of cover. So Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so uh, I'm Gez, uh, or Chris, and I'm the Director of Developer Relations, just have to remember my title, don't really use it very often. <laughs> um, I do dev DevRel at, uh, at Mycroft, um, and presuming that everyone knows what Mycroft is, if not, go to mycroft.ai. Um, uh, but yeah, the, my primary role is to support the community to be involved in Mycroft in, in all the many ways that that, that might involve. Um, but we're also a very small team. So I also do development and communication stuff and anything else that needs to happen, you know? Uh, so yeah, that's, that's me. You wear many hats. Many hats. Yeah. So uh, but what about you? You've got to introduce yourself as well. So my name is Steve. I work for Red Hat, um, which has absolutely nothing to do with this, but just um, I work as a consultant for Red Hat. So I go on client site and I attempt to solve problems that they have with, with particularly Kubernetes, OpenShift and containerization. So that's kind of my background. I've done Python for years. And while I don't consider myself a Python dev, I've gotten fairly decent at being able to to create some competent code, and I use that to kind of support my my workflow. And so, what I really liked about Mycroft is it's got a lot of Python, and that is an easy onboard for me, right? Like that was something that was really easy for me to pick up and get into. And so, with with uh, getting in touch with Chris, it has been a really interesting journey getting integrated into the Mycroft community. Again, I'm not I'm not a developer. There's there's a couple of guys out there like Jarvis who they're just producing volumes of, of skills all the time. And that's not going to be me. But what I can do is I tend to be the guy that ends up knowing people and making those connections. So I hope to be able to connect Chris with parts of the community and, and extend the reach and, and get some excitement around the project because I think it's a really important project to have a balance and, and a, an offering from the open source side of things to, to an Alexa or a, a Google Home. And so, yeah, the, we're hoping to show you how to get up and running with, with uh, Mycroft, particularly when you're talking about setting up virtual OMS or anything where you might need to target a specific version of Python or just generally onboarding into the development process. Yeah, fantastic. I couldn't agree more. And uh, we'll get into the, the technical side in a second, but just to focus on what you were just saying around contributing to Mycroft, like I think um, a lot of people think of open source as code in a GitHub repository or in, you know, in a, in a Git repository of some kind. Um, but we really believe in open source as you know, a movement of people who are all contributing to, to make this possible. And that, that includes developers. It includes, um, you know, technical writers or, or, you know, people who can communicate in a technical way. It includes people who have design skills. It includes testers, it includes, um, people contributing 
um, their data if they if they opt into the open data set. You know, there's there's just so many ways that um, people can contribute to Mycroft in a really meaningful way, and they are all as important as each other. So, just want to make that clear. And it, that really kind of works out for me because one of the skills that I have is being an information aggregator. I'm technical enough to be able to understand what I'm being told. I may not be an expert implementation uh, specialist, but what I can do is I understand the information well enough that I can then, um, well, I can teach it to other people. I'm able to translate some of that more difficult language into an easy to understand on-road path. And so my hope with this series is that working with Chris, we can really make onboarding into the project approachable. You know, like mm -hmm. one of the things I found was very interesting about the community was everybody says, oh, our community is so open and, and, you know, we're welcoming. Everybody says that. Nobody says, oh, our, our community is terrible. We're full of grumps. Uh, <laughs> but with, with Mycroft, I found that it actually was true. Like I actually felt a part of the team from the, from the near beginning, like people were there ready to answer the questions it's it's a small dedicated core of people even the volunteers but man are they passionate yeah absolutely we have, we have a really amazing group of people and um you know a lot of work's been put into that over over a long time um from from well before i joined the company um uh but you know i think it shows how much how much passion there is for an open source solution in this space um and particularly when you know we're we're at a time right now where where Mozilla's um, needing to scale back a lot of their work in the space, and and that's left a really big hole. And um, uh, yeah, I think it's really important for for projects like Mycroft and and other open source projects in this space to to really be open and approachable and to to work together um, wherever we can because we are going up against the biggest com companies in history. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the purpose of what uh, I hope to achieve here is we're going to walk through the kind of like the setup of, of Mycroft and how to onboard yourself into the common IOT. Um, and I think this is kind of important for us to capture because, um, you know, you and I have had several conversations as a sidebars how do I get this thing running or whatever? And I, I happen to be competent at Python, but I'm not at all competent with Git. Like I can do a clone and I can do a rebase, but that's, you know, kind of out of my wheelhouse. And so I was thinking there's probably a lot of other people like me that, that are competent on hacking on something, but how is it that we get them to a place where they can do this on their own and actually feel not lost? especially with Home Assistant and OpenHAB really kind of taking off. Um, mm. What I have here is I've got an Ubuntu 2004 because um, this is probably the most common tar target for development, I would think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the only thing that I have done so far is installed Git and all of the updates, and then I rebooted it. So we're cool. at completely fresh. So let's start with um, right now. So I want this to age well. And so the idea is, is we're probably going to be in this situation in the future where we're going to have to use virtual OMF for, for a previous version of Python because of the support that you have to give to different hardware products and stuff like that. So the yeah. idea here is, how do I set up a virtual OMF and how do I get Mycroft Core installed using that virtual OMF? Because by default, it wants to use the, the core Python in your system. So the the... the... The setup scripts um, that Micron ships with, uh, it, it will do both of those things for you. Um, okay. It'll create create the virtual environment, and um, you can pass in a, an argument to say what version of Python you want to use. Okay. So let's um, walk through that. So where do I get started here? Well, maybe we should open up the Microsoft documentation just so that we kind of show people 100%. You know where they go. So if we if we open a browser and, and head to microsoftai slash documentation. All right. So here we go. We are on the documentation the documentation page yeah. here. Cool. So we uh, we want to get Microsoft to start with, and then um, there's a, a range of ways that we can that we can use it. But 
Um, we're probably just interested in the micro for Linux. So the, the, the classic mechanism um, that, that most people uh, have used to date and that, you know, unless we say otherwise, this is kind of the, the way that, that we'll install it is, is using a git clone process. So if we scroll down to getting started, um, yeah, we can see that there's, there's four commands. The first one obviously just changes you into your root directory and then the next one finds the repository. So we'll do that. I normally like to have a git projects directory instead of putting things in the base of my home directory. So I'm just yep. creating that to, to help organize myself. Totally. And Mycroft shouldn't care where it lives on the system. Um, there's a lot of, like it will, it will try and um, put things in the places that it expects. Um, but we're also adding support for things like the XTG uh, oh. standard. Uh, so, so that, you know, if, if users are, are setting their systems up to use that standard, then, then it will, it will respect that. I'm going to go ahead and clone this and it... all right. Great. So now we're, so now... yeah, I'm going to go in here. So all I'm doing here is just, I'm just looking at these commands. So I'm assuming I don't want to run the, the dev setup yet or like that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's true. So, um, so we were talking, you were mentioning before that we, um, we might want to set a particular version of Python. Yeah. Um, and so I think by default, 2004, Ubuntu 2004 runs Python 3.8. Is that right? Apparently it doesn't have, uh, doesn't have Python installed. Oh, it's Python 3.8.2. Well, what version is in the Mark one? Because that's really what we're targeting here. We have to be the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Okay. Well then let's go 3.7. That's, that's what's in the Mark one now. So right, we'll do this. Ah, dead, dead snakes. Very nice. So the world moves, moves forward at a, a rapid pace. Yeah. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it doesn't feel like 3.7 came out that long ago. So while we're going through the, the installation process, Mycroft requires the Python headers, which is inside of the dash dev packages inside of the Debian based systems. So you're going to want to install Python 3.7, Python 3.7 uh, virtual env, which is the VENV package. You can install the docs if you want to. You can install bin utils and the, the uh, bin FMT support package. The ones you really need are the Python 3.7, the Python 3.7 vomv, and the Python 3.7 dev packages. All right, so now we want to get back to that um, that dev setup shell script. Okay. Um, so it's, it's it's like a setup wizard. You know, it'll it'll ask you some questions, um, set thing, set anything up automatically that it can. Um, but for this one, we want to pass in a uh, flag dash p um, for Python, and then we'll we'll pass in the Python 3.7. Like um, so that it knows, yeah, that's the, that's the version that we want to use. Um, and then it should use that to set up the virtual environment and therefore everything else that, that Microsoft does will then be, will be done within that environment. So, uh, yeah, so we can run that and Yes, we want to run the stable branch. Sure, we'll have it automatically update. Um, build mimic. Why uh, not? Don't do that right now. Oh, oh well, okay. I was just going to time lapse it, but sure. Do you want me to kill oh, the yeah, episode yeah. again? Uh, it, it will take a while. <laughs> All right, take two. <laughs> we can, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe don't do auto updates for the moment. Okay. Just for, just for the purposes of this, um, just because we'll be manually, you know, doing doing the Git stuff. Makes sense. Um, 
but yeah, I'd, I'd say no, just for the purposes of this tutorial. Um, it, it's a good thing to go and grab a copy on, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, let's add the helper commands. So this just adds the microcore slash bin directory to your path um, so that uh, it, it just exposes some, some helper commands to make things a little easier. Um, check for code style. If unsure, answer yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that, that's a good one to, to, to do as well, um, as long as you're happy to do it, uh, because it means if you, if you are um, contributing any code to the project, then um, you get a warning that something's wrong while you're trying to do the commit, rather than pushing the, pushing the code up and then having Mycroft's continuous integration services, you know, post public messages telling people that you have, you know, a, a trailing white space or some, something stupid, you know. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it just catches all that little, that little stuff. So are you using um, static analysis in like, I mean, usually stylistic things like PEP8 are, are mostly um, for static analysis and that sort of stuff. Um, is that what's happening in the, in the CICD pipeline? Uh, we, we just use Pilot. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that'll throw a lot of, that'll throw a lot of errors. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It throws a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's been talk about black as well, but that's a whole different discussion. Absolutely. Um, so this, this is a good question that will often come up as well. Um, so basically there's a, there's a package conflict, um, uh, and in the past, uh, it has caused some problems because, you know, with, with the way that Linux handles dependencies, you know, uh, if we remove, if we install a particular package and it, conflict with another package, it won't, it cannot allow both of those packages to exist. So it removes the other package. Um, and then it turns out that that package was a dependency of a dependency of a dependency. And uh, it, it particularly caused problems with, um, with wine. Uh, so anyway, now we just have this, this big warning there um, to say, please pay attention to what the installer is telling you it's going to remove. Um, so if we hit enter, it will then show us, um, what it's going to install and what's suggested and what will be removed. So in this case, um, the only thing being removed is that the jack. Deck. Yeah. So that's not going to cause any problems. Um, well, it's very unlikely to cause problems. The, the problem would be if it, you know, people are having, you know, wine and, uh, a, a range of other packages um, that we're relying on that libjack um, being removed and, you know, caused yeah. a whole lot of hassle. So it's out unlikely. of an abundance of caution, we just yeah. have that warning. <laughs> it's unlikely that uh, unless you're installing this on a professional audio system, you're probably not using libjack because um, jack takes a lot of extra setup to, to work through. So yeah, yeah. we're going to go ahead and run this now. Yeah, so dev setup will also run anytime there's a there's an, a significant update to, to the Microsoft Core um, software. Um, you know, if, if if you just change change a few lines of code, then then it won't need to run. But you know, any any actual update of the the Microsoft Core version, um, it will rerun dev setup to to make sure that everything's still you know that all the dependencies are up to date and and all that kind of stuff. Um, so this brings up a question that I thought I've been asked this quite a bit after writing those articles. And so people have been wondering, can you use Mycroft completely offline? Uh, because right now <laughs> it automatically proxies out to Google for a lot of its stuff. And so the questions have been like, can you use this offline? And my yeah. answer is, I'm not really sure. Basic answer is yes, but. Um, you can use Mycroft completely offline. The, the biggest issue is that speech to text. So the speech recognition, this, there isn't a great open source solution for that yet. So K 
Aldi is a long running project um, that was excellent when it first got released. Um, but you know, it's, it's pretty old now and they're still doing updates, but it's based on some pretty old technology and deep speech from Mozilla is the other player here. Um, but disregarding the, the changes that have very recently happened at Mozilla, even, even before that, um, you know, they didn't feel it was up to, to the standard required either. So, so their Firefox, um, voice project, I believe also used Google's STT service. Um, so, you know, it's something that we're working towards, but at the moment it's, it's not a simple task. So, uh, you can do it. Um, there is a, uh, a personal backend, um, which can replace the, what's called Selene, um, our home.microft.ai backend. Um, and one of our community members, Jarvis, uh, Jarvis has, <laughs> of said course Jarvis. it's him. No, it's, of course <laughs> it's him. <laughs> oh yeah. Jarvis. Yeah, yeah. He does everything. Uh, he's, uh, he's got a skill that actually, um, mocks out a backend. Um, so it is even simpler than the personal backend. Um, and so that's something that, that um, people can use as well. Obviously, things that aren't in the Microsoft Marketplace, there's always the disclaimer that if it's not in the Microsoft Marketplace, then we haven't reviewed it. Um, so people should be reviewing any code that they're putting on their devices. Um, and you could you could even choose to, to use Microsoft um, and still use cloud services. You know, take Microsoft's backend out of the equation um, is, an, is another option. I guess that the value that you get by using Mycroft's backend is that uh, all the requests to, to things like um, STT services are then proxied through Mycroft's servers um, and sent anonymously to the third party services. So, so Google can't tell that they can't profile individual users and say, okay, this person was uh, from this IP address was asking about this. And then they were asking about, you know, uh, this medical problem. And then they were asking about you know, <laughs> the opening time of this thing and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so they can't tell if it's, if it's one user asking 10,000 queries or 10,000 users asking one query each. Um, uh, and we, wherever possible, we, we send flags to, um, opt out of any data collection, um, by default we, yeah, we try and handle all that for you. And, um, and that's, yeah, I guess one of the, one of the values of using using our services now that we are now that we've got mycroft installed we should in theory have a vir virtual omv kicking around here that will be for python 3.7 yeah um to activate the virtual environment for us so we can we can just bash that oh sorry source it now we we should be if i just type python We've got Python 3.7.9. Excellent. Yep. Um, and just for people that aren't familiar with Python virtual environments, we can see at the start of the um, of the prompt, um, we've got a, a dot .vem in braces, um, which tells us that we're inside that virtual environment. And that's basically, it's kind of like a precursor to snaps where it took all it takes all of your dependencies and puts it in a local directory and then takes that at the front of your path for lack of a better way of putting it so that anything in the local mm. directory then like anything any pip stuff that you install the the python binary is also kicking around in here um so all of these things yeah. are are put locally for you yeah, and if you if you then uh, want to remove Mycroft um, and all of the dependencies that it's installed, you remove the well, you can remove the entire Mycroft core directory, or you can just remove the Mycroft core slash dot vnv, and that will blow away that virtual environment. So now that we've got Mycroft uh, installed, it probably hasn't been started yet. So is our next step then to start Mycroft? So I think let's do start Mycroft um, with a debug argument. So the debug argument is going to start all the services um, and, uh, and launch the, the command line interface as well. 
because you'll see some some messages about precise in green, um, because this is you know more of a development environment. It it doesn't come pre-shipped with um, with precise, so um, it falls back to a pocket sphinx uh, wake word spotter um, until it finishes grabbing that. Um, so you'll you'll probably notice that it's not as good at detecting your hey micros at first, and then once it's finished installing that, it'll it'll get better. So I'm gonna take this registration offline. I'm not actually gonna show that part, um, but I'm gonna do that here in the background. So, all right. So we've got Mycroft up and running, and one of the things that we were discussing in our little break was that. We initially ran with the debug, so we did a start mycroft.sh with the debug option here. But what I inadvertently learned was that if you leave the command line shell by doing this control C, it also stops all of the services because of the way that debug instantiates itself. So uh, what we were talking about was perhaps it's better to run the start all and then afterwards launch the mycroft-cli-client so that if you need to drop back out of the uh, out of the client here for any reason you're not actually taking mycroft out with you yeah so and in in some ways there's it can be benefits to both like if, if you're just wanting to run Mycroft quickly and then when you control c you've you've quit it and you can walk away um, you know that's nice and quick uh, if you if you do uh, start all services and then launch the, the CLI, then you need to make sure that if you don't want Mycroft running, that you stop Mycroft services as well. Um, that makes sense. So where do we go from here now that we've got a basic um, Mycroft instance up and running? Yeah. So now what we're interested in is installing the well. So we want to we want to get Home Assistant. Uh, running as an example skill um, that's using that can use the, the common IoT framework. Um, so because the the framework is is currently included in Microsoft Core, um, but it's not it's not publicly available. Um, so there's a there is a, another piece of the puzzle that we need to add in as well, which is the common IoT control skill. Because we're in the virtual environment, um, we can just use MSM, um, but even if you're not in the if you're not in the virtual environment, um, then you can use uh, I think as you were about to do is use the 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 Microsoft dash MSM command that's in the bin directory of Microsoft Core. Um, yeah, so uh, so MSM um, we want to install um, a skill, and uh, we can just use the the URL of any skill that we want to install. So um, for the common IoT, we'll probably want to go to GitHub. Oh, that is a very smart way of doing it. So is this the one we want, the skill IoT control? That's the one. Um, and so we'll just grab that URL and slam it in there. That's it. And that's all we need to do. Um, and so MSM will, as it said, it'll it'll clone that skill into your uh, slash op slash micro slash skills directory, which is symlinked from from skills within Microsoft Core. That's the one, uh, and it also installs any dependencies um, that the skill has defined. So, yeah, that that's all we need for the for the common IoT control skill. Um, and so now we want to go and grab the home assistant skill, um, which great. So that's that's installed in skills. Um, but by default, the, so the version of home assistant in the marketplace is not using the common IoT framework yeah. at the moment, um, and so. What we want to do is change into the directory for that skill, and um, we're going to 
switch to the branch of that skill um, where the development for common IoT has been happening. Yeah, so to switch over, we can just do git checkout, that's it. Feature slash common IoT. Okay. Will that work or do I need to truncate this? Well, I'm not this? sure if that will work. Yeah. Give it a try. This will create some mild issues. So if you if you just do git checkout um, and truncate to feature, that's it. Um, that should be better because that will then track from the remote branch. Um, and so now anytime you reference feature slash common IoT, it's going to know that you're referencing the that the branch of that that is on the origin becomes more important when you when you start um, adding in different um, different repositories. So when we fork uh, the project into our own GitHub account um, because we want to make some changes and do our own development on it, and then we want to contribute those changes back up to the parent project. Um, we're then going to end up with two remotes, one that is in Microsoft AIs uh, and one that's in our own GitHub account. And that's where we'll, we'll get into a bit more of that. That's switched over to the um, new branch um, that we can see there. Uh, and should we have a look at what the, what the requirements are um, just to make sure, just to see if they've changed. So maybe do cat cat requirements okay mm, there's a readme there's no requirement oh sorry anymore. manifest um it's using the newer manifest that yeah we'll... so we need python requests and there's your iot skill iot control yeah that one's actually something i missed so this new uh manifest.yaml um way of defining um, requirements means that you can define you can actually define three types of requirements so one is system packages one is python dependencies that you can see there with requests and then you can actually require that another skill exists for your skill to run and so those skills they have to be in the in the microsoft marketplace you know, for it to for it to work um so it can't just go and grab stuff off of know, github ready. yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so uh, for those people who might be interested in learning a little bit more about how to develop a skill. Uh, we'll leave a link to a series of articles on opensource.com about how to go through the process of starting your first skill, kind of walking through. So we talk a little more about dependency handling and the, the different ways that are out there and, and things like that. So if that's your speed, take a look for the link in the description and follow kind of from start. I know nothing about Mycroft development to all the way building your first skill. Okay, so it looks like we have got Microsoft set up, uh, so that's probably a good place to, to leave the first video. Mm -hmm. uh, today we covered a few tips uh, for Git when when we first pull down the when we first clone the repo, uh, just to avoid some issues later on down the track. Uh, we looked at some arguments that you can use while installing Microsoft, such as setting a particular version of Python. We looked at the difference between some of the arguments when when running Mycroft, so looking at you know Mycroft uh, start all versus start debug, um, and why we might use one or not the other. Some of us uh, on this call uh, <laughs> think that you should never use a particular argument um, being debug, uh, um, and and it, yeah. It, Particularly if if it's not clear about why why they are or what they're going to do, um, it, it can be a bit confusing. Um, so we definitely do need to update the the documentation for that as well and make that a bit clearer. But but uh, anyway, we covered that, and uh, we also looked at how to install skills from outside of the marketplace uh, using the the Microsoft Skills Manager. Um, in this case, specifically to install the the IoT control skill so that we can. We can get into that um, with Home Assistant, hopefully. Uh, what what do we got up next? Yeah, so next time I think what we're going to try and do is have a Home Assistant instance where we have a device or two attached to it, and we're going to then work with connecting Mycroft to that Home Assistant instance. And so 
I'll look to see if I have, say, um, an LED strip or something that's easy for me to show on camera so that, yeah, yeah, my LED strips behind me. Um, we won't be using those. Those are my child indicator lights. So at night, uh, I have a motion sensor in the hallway outside of the room and it triggers this light behind me when someone has wandered away into either the bathroom or out in the hallway. Um, so that's an example of how you can use Home Assistant to help you maintain your house. And what we, we ultimately want to do with, with this project is integrate Mycroft with that because that is this these lights here are time sensitive they won't trigger during the day but there might be a case where we want to have extra light around our table out there and so it would be very helpful for me to, for me to be able to say hey mycroft turn on the tables the table lights and so our next step is to set up the vm that will host home assistant and then make that connection from mycroft into home assistant and so with that, this kind of wraps up our current, uh, our current video and we'll move on to the next one. But we really want to hear from people because as much as uh, I love to hear Chris talk, it's, uh, it's much easier. It's a lot less work for me if we don't record our conversations and I have to edit them. So we really, we're making these videos to try and be helpful to the community. And so we're open to suggestions of, of what you'd like to hear. Um, what kind of topics you'd like us to cover, if we, if we should bring on guests, if we can get them to come on. And so ultimately, we, we're here to try and, and serve the community, right? I, I want to see this project blossom because while I may not have all the technical skills to make it awesome, maybe I can reach somebody and excite you into you making the awesome commit. That's just something that I absolutely needed to have inside of Mycroft. So we really want to hear from you and you can reach out on, so I'm on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way to get me. So you can tweet at L I N U X ovens, O V E N S at Linux ovens. And that will be down in the description. You can find me writing on open source.com. There's plenty of ways to get a hold of us. You can come in into the chat for Mycroft and ping either one of us. We, we both lurk in there pretty much unless my browser crashes. I'm in there all day, every day. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, Chris, how, how can people get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, Mycroft chat, you know, that's, I, I live in there. Uh, so chat.mycroft.ai is a good place. Uh, I am on Twitter at Chris Gesling, uh, Chris with a K. Uh, I'm, I'm the only one in the world, so if you can't find me, then, then <laughs> you're not searching well. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, absolutely. We, we want to hear from people. We want to know, you know, what are what are the areas that that you want to hear us uh, talk in more detail about? You know, where are the where are the bits that that um, would help you to to contribute uh, to Mycroft? So you mentioned being the only one in the world with with that name. I have a little a little story to end on. So there is apparently a gentleman in Australia of all places that shares my exact name who has some level of authority in his company. And I for several months was getting his email. Uh, and I would reply back that they they're sending this to the wrong email. So my email address had a period in it and his did not and they were putting the period in the email address. So I was getting his email and I was getting emails like, you know, we really need to dismiss this person or, you know, yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy. And so when I was picking my Twitter handle, I, I was aware of the fact that this guy has a bigger social media presence than I do. And I'm like, I don't want any kind of, you know, conflict here. So <laughs> I kind of picked the, my last name and the thing that I, I'm most passionate about and I put them together. I'm like, man, I sure hope I don't get this guy's stuff again. So that's just <laughs> a little funny story to end on. And with that, uh, yeah. and with that I think uh, we'll catch you next time and we look forward to hearing from you. And please do contact us because we really want to make this useful to you. Definitely. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Until next time. Ciao.